Our next speaker is a graduate of Fred Hardeman University back in 92. Also is a graduate of the Spring Bible Institute when we had it operating here strictly as a uh, located work. He's preached full time for 12 years, part time for 20 years, directed Bible camps, held various gospel meetings. He's preached in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee, and various lectureships in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. He's married to his wife, Laura, and their daughter. They have one daughter, Jenna. He's currently a part of attending the Fitzhatchley Road Congregation, Huntsville, Texas. We think very highly of Wayne, his love for the truth, his dedication. And we may say that we think highly of his family, where it all started. <laughs> My father said one time when he saw our family, he looked at mother and he said, did we begin all of this? <laughs> I'm not saying they've said that about your wife. <laughs> Just want to tell you what he has been said, you know how it goes. We're appreciative. We wish there was more who were that dedicated. And I must say, as the Fish Hatchery Road eldership and congregation, it's another one of those lighthouses in a very dreary world, and we commend them highly. But Wayne will do us a, a great job in uh, speaking on humanism and pluralism. Is man the measure of all things? Come speak to us, Brother Wayne. I appreciate again to be able to speak here this year, uh, but I appreciate even more being able to be here in the fellowship of my brethren. It's a joy to be able to uh, be with people of like mind and like faith. A woman named Janine Garofalo, you don't need to know who she is, she's an actress of some sort, but she made this comment. The reason a person is, con is a conservative Republican is because something is wrong with him. Again, that's science. That's neuroscience. You cannot be well-adjusted, open-minded, pluralistic, enlightened, and be a Republican. It's counterintuitive. And they revel in their anti-intellectualism. They revel in their cruelty. <clears throat> That's what they think of those who call themselves conservatives. And when I say they, I mean anybody that's not. Because that comes from not only the Hollywood left, but also from people in the denomination and people, sadly, among even our own brethren. How could you dare be a Republican? Now, this morning, we're going to talk a lot about politics, but it's not for politics' sake. I am not here condoning or uh, endorsing any particular thing, but I think it's important for us to understand politically, how pluralism and humanism makes its way through this world. Because as you know, so goes society. As society goes, so goes the church. And so a lot of these things that we'll hear people say uh, in time, it kind of filters down. Next thing you know, we got brethren championing those same type of things. And that's what in essence has happened. Rush Limbaugh said, and not that he's any particular authority, but he is an authority in this country. He said, liberalism doesn't care about being right, only about what makes one feel good. And I believe that's a true statement. Because liberalism is not concerned about right and wrong as a general statement. And as I said, 
we need to be concerned in the Lord's church because these things are barometer of what is happening out in the world is what is going to happen in the Lord's church. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. When you begin to look at philosophy and all the things that entail therein, one of the greatest philosophers I think about is Solomon. You may not look at him, give him the label of a philosopher, but he was. Philosophy in its purest form is just trying to answer some basic questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Uh, these type of questions. Well, Solomon asked those very questions. Solomon began a journey that took him from being just a man, uh, a just man, to a man of the world. In the book of Ecclesiastes is where he began his search. He began to look for the meaning of life, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 13. And in his search, he finds worldly, worldliness, what the world has to offer. Solomon concluded that true joy comes not in the things that the world has to offer, but true joy comes in understanding that God must be the center of one's life. And that's what he concluded. What is the final conclusion? He said that we should eat and drink with a merry heart, express our joy in how we live, live joyfully with the wife of your youth, remember God in the days of your youth, and fear God and keep his commandments. So this morning we put forth the idea of what uh, pluralism and humanism, are they the standard whereby we can be guided in this life? But we need to define these terms. And I'll be quite frank with you, humanism I kind of knew something about. But pluralism, okay, I understand the word pluralism. I didn't understand it as a movement. But you know, pluralism, as you will see, is permeating all aspects of our lives. From politics to religion to your basic communities that you live in, pluralism is alive and well. If you were to define pluralism, you would basically go and look to uh, a lot of different things, but there was a Greek philosopher by the name of Heraclitus uh, around 535 to 475 B.C. That is basically the one who is uh, given this idea that he founded this idea. He came up with the idea that change is central to the universe. It's just a, it's just, it has to be. Things change constantly. And if we are different, we must figure out ways to come to terms with those differences. Pluralism has the view that all religions are right in some ways, and our attitudes toward them should be one of acceptance and diversity. But what does pluralism mean? Well, it is promoted as a system for the common good of all. Think about some of these terms because we're going to deal with them a little bit more in, in depth. But it is a system for the common good of all. Pluralism, I think, could also be defined as socialism. But they just gave it another fancier word. It is the coming together with common recognition and credence to all beliefs and developments of modern social, scientific, and economic societies. Pluralism, in order for it to function and be successful in, achie in achieving the common good, all groups have to agree to a minimal consensus regarding both shared values which tie the different groups to society and shared rules. 
Religious pluralism is a set of worldviews that spans on the premise that one religion is not the sole exclusive source of values or truths as supreme deity. It therefore must recognize that at least some truth must exist in other belief systems. I believe that in one sense. I believe that not all people who call themselves religious are teaching all error. But that's not what pluralism is getting at. It's basically saying you have to accept them in their error, no matter what it is. And you've got to figure out a way to deal with that. But if you think about it, what this does is it begins to open the door to atheists, to Muslims, Hindu, all the different types of world religions that we see, and anything else that man may come up with to worship or to join. You run an article in any paper or on a billboard showing God how God views homosexuality, denominations, or any other moral evil, and sit back and wait for the phone calls from our members from the members of our more tolerant society. Preaching on certain topics like adultery, alcohol, fellowship, etc or as the brethren call, moving sermons for many preachers today. Even among our more tolerant brethren. But what is moral pluralism? It is the assumption that there are moral truths, but that they do not form a body of coherent and consistent truths as those found in the sciences and mathematical approach. In other words, there is no absolute truth. And because there's no absolute truth, well then, we're constantly updating what we believe because we're constantly changing. Do you see where that would wind up? Today you believe this, but then, you know, as I change, as my life experiences come and always, well, I changed again. I don't believe exactly the way I used to. And on and on and on. These beliefs are plural. In other words, there are many truths, not just one, and at times they do conflict with one another. We all inhabit a common world with common judgments and interpretations taking a part in that process. For some, if the action gives a positive result, they consider the action a morally good thing to do. I think it was. Ah, what a gift for thinking off the top of my head. Um, I think it was Pelosi, who just in the last few weeks believes that we need to have more money given to contraception and birth control so that an abortion, so that more children will be aborted. And that will take care of our problems as far as too many people populating the world. That's a pluralistic type attitude toward life as God created. But in her mind, it brings forth a positive result. It's a good thing, even though what I'm doing is in and of itself murder. Is still a good thing. Others look at how the consequences will affect us. They believe each person is the best judge of his or her own self-interest, and therefore it leads to selfishness, but morally encourages compassion and love and a sense of others. We've already talked yesterday, someone brought up the idea of it takes a village. That's getting into this idea, this touchy, feely, uh, I feel good about myself, therefore it must be good. And then there's a group who thinks we should do what produces the greatest good for everyone. 
and not just for me. That's socialism, Marxism, whatever else you want to call it. And we're getting a taste of that in this last election. The casual look then ask a question. Who's going to judge what a positive result is? Well, I'll tell you what they'll say, an elitist group of people will make that judgment. And in essence, they will say, your elected politicians will make that judgment. A jihadist would have a very skewed view on what is positive in relation to what I might find positive. Or a skinhead. He may find a very different worldview as to what is positive to him, but if you were to ask the Jew how positive is what that man holds. Subjectivism is not a basis for what is right or wrong in regards to morality. But pluralism is more than just tolerance. Tolerance is the idea of allowing something to be to be, even if it's an offensive to an individual, for the idea of keeping a peace. But pluralism goes deeper. It is the idea of meeting around a bunch of people, meeting around some tables and having dialogue and trying to see where we can come down on common ground. An example in the book is the Ten Commandments on federal land. There were those that look at Ten Commandments and they believe that it forms uh, formed over 20 instructions and they're grouped into two types of sections. The first section is a series of orders that people must recognize God as our only deity. These deny the, legis the legitimacy of other religions and a secular lifestyle. This is a purely religious document. It threatens, listen to it, it threatens non-believers with retribution from God, which will affect the non-believer, their children, and their grandchildren. And it produces some real First Amendment rights concerning the idea that it promotes a specific religious tradition. The second part is a slightly longer series of commandments forbidding such behaviors as lying and stealing, committing adultery, murdering people. This set of behavioral laws was combined with elements of pagan Roman law and facets of other legal systems to produce systems of law common to many jurisdictions in the, world, in the Western world. The idea of thou shalt have no other gods before me some find these words very offensive. And that's the mindset of a pluralist. So what's the remedy? Well, we moved, we, we removed the uh, Ten Commandments on federal land because a minority of people found them to be offensive. The interesting thing is that the majority of the citizens of the United States of America don't agree with this ruling. But our Supreme Court don't really care. Nor do they uphold what the majority want. Only what a minority of people can and will sue to get. To further demonstrate this idea, the homosexual debate continues to widen. In a pluralistic society, we need to figure out a way to be able to tolerate homosexuality and be less willing to condemn those who are homosexual. The following shows a dilemma that some are now having. It says many conservative Christians see themselves as loving the homosexual while hating their behavior. They feel, they feel that they are mirroring God's will. They interpret a half dozen or so biblical passages which involve same-sex sexual behavior as condemning all homosexual behavior. They feel that their beliefs and practices are biblically based and thus not only accessible but compulsory to all Christians who believe it, who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. 
they deeply resent being called homophobes, which they consider a swear word, for simply carrying out what they believe is the word of God. And the, the, the thing continues on, but the idea here is they're trying to figure out, okay, this is where you stand on this, but in a pluralistic society, we've got to figure out how we're going to get around this. So what do they say? Well, the English language obviously lacks precision. What is badly needed is a group of words to describe each of the forms that negative reaction, that forms that negative reaction to homosexuality takes. One word to describe feelings of fear and loathing. Another to describe action to oppress gays and lesbians. Another to describe moral and religious disapproval. What is their result? Well, unfortunately, such words don't exist at this time. And until they do, dialogue will continue to be difficult, and many hard feelings will propagate. That's why we can't come to terms on this. That's why we can't agree. We just don't have the right words to use. We'll stop there for now on pluralism because I need to touch on humanism. Man alive. Humanism defined. Contemporary humanism can be tracked back to the time of Buddha and Confucius. Um, and basically humanism, uh, they put out a humanist manifesto that basically clarifies exactly what they believe. First of all, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. You go on through, uh, humanism recognizes that man, religious culture, and civilization is the product of a gradual development due to his interaction with his natural environment and with his social heritage. The individual born into a particular culture is largely molded by that culture. In other words, it's not your fault who you are. You don't have a choice in it. Humanism asserts that the nature of the universe depicted by modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. The distinction between a sacred and a secular can no longer be maintain maintained. Um, if you want to read all these, they're in the book. Um, number 14. A socialized and cooperative economic order must be established to the end that the equitable distribution of the means of life be possible. The goal of humanism is a free and universal society in which people voluntarily and intellectually co cooperate for the common good. Pluralism is doing the same thing. At least that's what they say. Humanisms, humanists demand a shared life in a shared world. And then last, they seek to affirm life rather than deny it. Deny it. They seek to elicit the possibilities of life, not flee from them. And they endeavor to establish the conditions of a satisfactory life for all. As simply stated, humanism considers man to be the measure of all things with no need for belief in a supreme being. So where do these philosophies take us? Well, in religion, we see that pluralism and humanism have great influence in many followers of such. And I want to read these three quotes, and I have a fourth one that I have gotten since. But Billy Graham said in 1987, I used to believe that pagans in far-off countries were lost. They were going to hell, and I no longer believe that. I believe that there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God. Pope John Paul II said, It will be in the sincere practice of what is good in their own religious traditions and by following the dictates of their own conscience that the members of other religious religions respond positively to God's invitation and receive salvation in Jesus Christ even while 
they do not recognize or acknowledge him as their Savior. Now, how can you have salvation in someone that you don't believe in? Well, not long ago, these same popes list Muslims, and they refer to them as Mohammedans, as those who are generally considered people that they can fellowship. It's what the Catholic Church believes. Here are people that don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. In essence, they believe in Jesus, that he was probably a good man, but that's about it. President Obama, 2004. I am a Christian, so I have a deep faith. I'm rooted in the Christian tradition. I believe that there are many paths to the same place, and that is a belief that there is a higher power, a belief that we are connected as people. That's his stand on religion. So nobody could say that I'm trying to be one-sided. What does President Bush say? Our former president, the one that just stepped down, 43. Is the Bible literally true? Bush says, you know, probably not. No, I'm not a literalist. But I think you can learn a lot from it. But I do think that the New Testament, for example, is it has got, you know, the important lesson. God sent a son. That's how President Bush views the word of God. He also believes, he doesn't believe totally in evolution, but he does believe parts of it. When I think, you know, you can have both, I think evolution can, you know, you're getting me way out of my lane here. Uh, this is a direct quote. This is him talking. You know, he kind of talks sometimes. I'm just a simple president. But it's, I think that God created the earth, created the world. And I think the creation of the world is so mysterious. So he leaves doubt for... Well, you know, evolution could be true. It explains some of those things I don't understand. <clears throat> Man, we don't have any time left. Thirteen? Oh, that's right. We started late. Okay. Well, I got thirteen minutes. <laughs> Still don't have enough time. A new report came out not long ago saying that the numbers had gone up in 2007 regarding that what our government classifies as those, in quotes, have very low food security. I don't know. That's government speak. Basically means they might not have a meal every time. But is that really what that means? The point is that the numbers have risen over 50%. And the new president has much to do to solve the problem. And a casual reader would read that and say, you know, we're in dire straits. We've got people out here that are literally starving to death. But is that really what that says? You need to understand why these people are finding themselves in these situations. If one were to rely strictly upon man to figure it out, as our government does, then we need more taxes, we need more money, we need more people helping, we need more things. But the problem is deeper than that. We need truth to be taught about marriage. You see, what they fail to point out, I mean, it might be down in real small print, but you can't read even with these. 
but they're talking about single mothers, unwed mothers, divorced mothers, and how that they are slowly going down further and further money-wise. They're not destitute yet, but a casual reading of this article makes you believe that, well, man, we've got people dying all around us. They can't eat. But that's not the truth. Humanism allows for man to decide what is moral. And man alone will determine the good for his fellow man. <clears throat> oh, let's skip all this. I ain't reading the book. All right. I want to read some of this. Some of this is not in the book because I want to get it on tape. Because I, if you go to somewhere and just put in pluralism, you can read all day long. But it's good reading. I, I'm telling you, this is some good stuff to try to understand what's happening in our world because uh, we've got a lot of things going on. Pluralism is a theory that a multitude of groups, not the people as a whole, let me back up and restate that. Pluralism is the theory that a multitude of groups, not the people as a whole, govern the United States. Think about that. It's true because you got people, what do we hear about all the time? Money's exchanging hands. Who's giving them all that money? Groups not the people. These organizations, which include, among other unions, trade and professional associates, environmentalists, civil rights activists, business and financial lobbies, formal and informal coalitions of like-minded citizens, influence the making and administration of laws and policy. <clears throat> Some pluralists believe that direct democracy is not only unworkable, it is not even necessarily desirable. In other words, what do we need democracy for? These groups will tell us what we need to do, one way or the other. Robert Dahl, a noted pluralist, suggested, he says, most people, he explained, concentrate their time and energies on activities involving work, family, health, friendship, recreation, and the like. Other pluralists go further. They worry that the common person, now listen to me, common person lacks the virtues, the reason, the intelligence, and the patience for self-government. And that direct democracy leads to anarchy and the loss of freedom. You want to know why our politicians act the way they do, the arrogance they have, how they look down upon all those people from the South because those poor ignorant folk don't understand anything. So let me do this for you. It comes from this pluralistic attitude. If Americans do not decide major controversies themselves or indirectly through elections, how are such things resolved? Well, pluralists are concerned, are convinced that public policy emerges from competition among groups. Competition among groups. Since relatively few people participate actively in this process, power, it might seem, would be a concentrated in very few hands. But how do they look at power? Well, in the first place, power is not an identifiable property that humans possess in a fixed amount. Rather, people are powerful because they control various resources. In other words, the deeper your pockets, the more power you have. We see that all the time, don't we? We're talking about politics. Resources are assets that can be used to force others to do what one wants. Force them 
to do what one wants. Some pluralists contend, since this acceptance of demographic, democratic norms is higher among leaders than the general public, political disagreements are best settled at the top where they can be dealt with fairly and dispassionately, keeping the intolerant and short-sighted masses. They're talking about us. You catch who they, what they called us? To keep the intolerant and short-sighted masses at bay helps ensure the system's safety and stability. You see, if we got involved in the political process, why, we can mess something up, because we don't know any better. We, we don't come from money. You can't make those kinds of decisions. The theory, in short, argues that American government stays free because its main participants, the individuals who actually make policy, agree on a code of conduct that is not always shared by the public at large. And that's true. And whenever they are a pluralistic mindset type of people, I will guarantee you this, they will not pass laws that will glorify God. They'll glorify the things of this world. There's never been a time when God has left man to decide what is right or wrong. Contrary to the humanist belief, man does not have to search out his own moral code and live by such. Jeremiah wrote, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. Solomon wrote, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3 and verse 6. Eve took of the fruit, and it was to make her wives as God. And from that time to the present, man is continually seeking to become as wise as God, yet failing so woefully short in that objective. These philosophies are directly opposed to the scriptures. We are to understand that we all come from different backgrounds, there's no doubt, we're diverse. And we are to be willing to love all or accept. But pluralism is not talking of that concept. What pluralism seeks to do is accept those who practice sin in the name of acceptance and diversity. Many of our brethren need to understand this point today. We're seeing everywhere, evermore, the idea of accepting someone even if they are in sin. You see this seeds of acceptance being allowed when we hear people say things like this. Well, you know, we don't do it like the liberals do. Or, well, we don't want to do this because it might split a real big split in the brotherhood. What we are seeing is the attitude that some who commit some sin are okay. But we want to fellowship others who commit those type of sins, but these are okay. Who's going to be the judge of which sin is acceptable or not? Well, we are seeing that it depends on whether you are, you have money, just like politics, secular politics. If you've got money and you've got influence, or if you like one guy more than the other, or if you went to the right school, The very nature of the gospel puts Christians at odds with the majority of people. The very nature of the gospel does. And it does not make us very accepting or a very diverse group. It makes us people with problems with our brains. What Janine Garofalo said, we've got brain problems. Well, we're going to stop there. I don't want David getting up here saying something bad about me. God made us all to be diverse. 
and willing to accept and love our fellow man. God sent his son to earth out of love for all of us, John 3 and verse 16. The idea of diversity and the condoning of people who practice all manner of sin and will worship is not, nor ever has been, what God accepts. Nadab and Abihu serve as a reminder to all of us that God wants worship done a certain way, his way. He wants all of us to be willing to accept the diversity of people into our fellowship, but they must be willing first and foremost to accept the terms of fellowship with God before they can be in our fellowship. Thank you for your time. Any money up here? Mike, you're soft, right? You're soft, you know? We deeply appreciate the good work that he's put in on the research and gathering up all this material and the presentation. Humanism is really just simply the active arm of atheism. And since atheism says there is no God, and humanism just says the measure of all things is man, and everything is centered in on man. So they can't really operate any other way other than uh, the definition of pluralism as it's been set out this morning. Um, if you look into any of the work of the social scientists, you'll see that they always, whether it's research of any kind they do, they're doing surveys of people to see what the people think. Now, there'll be a review of literature, but there's always an effort to see what the people think. And that's their, their whole approach to everything, whether you like it or not. Uh, social studies people are the ones that are determining the social policy of this country. And they've got their finger on the pulse of folks. And they're trying to allow for all of the different whatever, because there is no God and there is no absolute objective standard of truth. So what are you going to have? Brethren, here's what it comes down to. What was the standard of truth under Stalin in Russia? What was the standard of truth under Hitler? Whoever had the control, and they said what was right, and if you didn't like it, you didn't have to worry about being right any longer. They had a place for you. That's exactly what this comes down to. Well, why is that right, Mama? Because if we don't, they're going to kill us. Why should we do this, or why should we not do this? Well, you want a job, don't you? That's exactly what it comes down to. It always has. You reject God, what is the highest? Authority there is. It's got to be the government. It's got to be the government. There is nothing else left if you reject God and you reject his will. And so people who are power hungry want to run government. That's exactly what it is. You can take all the political science that you want to study. And I've studied little of it. You can read all the history you want to, and that's exactly what it reduces down to. He who has the power. You don't have the money if you got the power. He who has the power controls things. You set the standards. People dance to your team. And that's exactly why people want, for the most part, to be the heads of government. They want to rule. It's not by accident that most of the people in the United States Senate are millionaires. They have their money. Now they want power. It's what Satan offers. Fall down and worship me, said the Christ. And I will what? Give you everything you see. You think he's saying he changed his operation? No, he, why should he change? He's talking about a pragmatist. He knows exactly what works to catch people and reel them in. Going about seeking human aid of ours. So we need to be aware of what humanism is, the active arm and agent of atheism, and that the only result that can come of humanistic viewpoint is pluralism. We've got to figure out how everybody's going to do something, and then people begin to scramble to say, I've got to be in power because I want to set the standard. We've got to break here. It's time.